So search relevance organizational maturity model. That's a mouthful, right? Uh, and what does that mean? Well, instead of telling you all what that means, I'm gonna try and describe it for you, okay? Um, over the course of this talk, if you have a question, please raise your hands or yell. Uh, and towards the end, I have a couple of web pages for you guys to go look at. So if you got your computers out, I've got some bit.ly links for you to go check out. So uh, I'm happy to see people on laptops. So um, I'm going to describe most search teams' strategy for solving search problems. And I'll be curious if it reflects your team's strategy when faced with a search problem. A search problem like people can't find what they're looking for, so they're, not, they're doing searches, but they never add to my cart on an e-commerce website. Or everybody comes to the home page and then bounces away. Or I get lots of searches. People are very busy interacting with the search engine, but whatever desired result I want doesn't happen. Or maybe even we want better search because someone said we need better search uh, and you have, no you, know, you have no idea how to fix it. So I think a lot of people's search strategy kind of looks like this. Yes, that is spaghetti thrown on the wall, right? But I want to caveat that this isn't like I have a strategy around throwing spaghetti at the wall, like I'm going to figure out what kind of red sauce is going to paint a big messy picture or debate the merits of angel hair versus regular spaghetti thrown on a wall, which is going to adhere better, right? I have a strategy around throwing spaghetti on the wall. This instead is, I think, most people's response to a problem, which is we flail. Right? We try a bunch of things. Uh, maybe we'll work with synonyms. Why don't we download WordNet and put that into our synonyms.txt file? Or maybe what we need to do is a big revamp of our UI, because that's going to solve all of our problems. Right? Or, oh, let's include more fields, because we're missing on these fields. So let's add all the fields in the schema to my query, and then turn on eDismax, because that must be better than dismax. Right? And so we have this, you know, we, we, we feel like this guy here, right, who's playing that whack-a-mole, you know, playing that whack-a-mole game where he's hoping that the changes that he's rolling out and the changes he's making are going to be better than what was there before. And so you make all these changes, you tweaks, small fixes, you push them out, and you end up with this response from your users. Apathy. They don't even notice it, right? The behavior doesn't change. Nothing good happened, right? And you're like, oh, okay, well, that didn't work. All right, well, what can we do next? And so you start reaching for progressively you know, bigger changes and things that are going to be more significant, right? Ah, let's update to the latest version of solar because that's going to help our search results. Or uh, we need all of the data. Or um, my queries have to look at more fields, right? And then we get this response from our users, right? They went from apathetic to they hate it. They're like, wait, whoa, what'd you do? You changed everything. All my search results are broken. Like, ah, right? So I live in Charlottesville, Virginia. The original slide, thank you. Uh, the original slide was uh, people rioting in the streets, and I felt like that was in poor taste. So I updated it for angry man. So then I've got these angry results, right? Angry people, right? Things are not going good, well. And this leaves me feeling like this, right? I am like, okay, what do I do next? What is, you know, I'm panicky and everything that I'm doing seems to be making the problem worse, right? Does this sound like anyone's search efforts? Anyone's experiences? Okay, yeah, it's a little hard to raise your hand, but uh, you know, I definitely have gone through that same set of feelings. One more change, that'll fix it. So what I suggest is that you really need to think about what do your searchers want, right? 
what do your searchers want to do on your website and, uh, or with your search engine? And for many of us, it's hard to think that way because we're most of the people in the search industry kind of come up the developer ranks, right? We think about writing code, we think about writing unit tests, we write, think about features and functionality, but we don't really think about what is it that our users are trying to do. So how can we think about what our users want? Well, what I'd like to talk about today is sort of based on a model of thinking about what does any human being want, and I'm gonna go for out of life, so bear with me a little longer. How many people of you are familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Excellent, okay, good. So you all know that it uh, describes a theory of motivation where people, human beings, we are motivated by these unsatisfied needs, right? And we have to solve our lower needs before we can move up and solve our higher needs, right? So looking at that from bottom to top, right? We start out with our physiological needs, right? We, we need food, we need water, we need warmth, right? These basic mechanics of survival. Once we've met those, we can start thinking about safety, right? A place to sleep, right? In, you know, a place to sleep, I could start thinking about not just in the moment, but in the slightly tactical sense, right? Once I have those things, then, all right, I can move up. I can start thinking about my psychological means, right? I know that I'm gonna survive to see the next sunrise. I know I'm gonna survive to see next year. What do I wanna do between now and next year? And so we as human beings are very tribal, so belongingness and love is kind of something that we really need. And if we don't have that, right, then it's very difficult for us to move up to our esteem needs, right? So our ability to have prestige, our ability to control our futures, to feel like autonomous, you know, autonomous people versus functional unit 52, please report to work, right? So then we kind of looking for those esteem needs. And once we have that, right, then there's this idea that we all have potential. There's a best version of us, right? There is a best version of Eric Pugh, one who's confident about presenting, delivers great technical advice, is a good dad to his kids, and does great woodworking projects, not somewhat crummy woodworking projects, right? That's the self-actualization for me. So this is a way of looking at people's desires and wants. Well, there's a lesser known Maslow's hierarchy for the searcher, and that's what I wanna talk to you all a little bit about today as a way of framing the what do my users want and how can I improve on that? So somewhat similar, right? I went with the structure of basic needs, psychological needs, and self-fulfillment needs, right? So from the search user's perspective, what is the most basic need, right? Using the sort of idea of a movie searching, right? A movie searching website, what is the most basic thing? I could type in Star Wars and get back all nine, eight, seven, nine, 12. I don't know how many movies there are now for Star Wars, right? But I could get them. And, you know, I could see, I got the 10 blue links on my web page. I can paginate, right? I've got some search results. I can find Star Wars, right? That is the most basic need that your website needs to accomplish to meet your searcher. Then moving up on the uh, uh, moving up on the hierarchy, right, is a clean modern UI. Now I look forward to talking to all of you after this talk because I suspect different people will have different opinions on the hierarchy of needs of the searcher, but I do feel like a clean modern user interface covers up a multitude of bad relevancy 
search. It's one where we have not 50 facets that no one will ever look at, but five that make sense. It's one where maybe I get a little bit of auto-suggest or some spell check, right? So that when I type in Arnold Schwarzenegger, it actually finds Arnold Schwarzenegger despite the typos that I put in. And ideally, it's fast, right? Because this, if nothing else I've learned, a really fast search engine is, you know, a really fast search engine goes a long way to making people happy compared to a slow one. So once we get this sort of UI and done, that's, that's our basic needs. We have a platform. People can interact. They can do things with it, right? So where do we go next, right? And that is starting to think about relevance, right? And this is one of the big themes of this year's Lucene Revolution has been really exciting as the number of relevance talks, right? Uh, and, you know, four years ago, we talked a lot more about scaling and ops farther maybe down in the stack. Now we're moving up, and so we're having some really interesting conversations. And so, you know, here's an example, right, is the actor Kumail, right? He's both an actor, a director. If I put a query in for him, I understand why I got the search results back, right? The perceived relevance, it makes sense. I get why the search engine is giving back. I'm not confused. Um, and maybe I'm actually sorting the results on a best match, right? How many people, I'm working on a project right now where we do all of this fancy querying and then we sort by the time the document was created. Not by like popularity or publishing or anything else, just whenever it was created, right? Uh, terrible. So uh, you know, then we're moving up and we're starting to address sort of, you know, why is the, you know, you, what is the user trying to do? Keep going up that hierarchy, right? And now we're thinking about contextualization, right? This is where the search engine is really starting to have a conversation with the user, right? And again, if your search experience is really fast, then it's really easy to have a long conversation, ask lots of questions, interact a lot, collect lots of clicks, uh, look at your search results, understand, oh, they always look at this, they you know, track when they come back and what their history is, right? So contextualization, personalizing the search results, if you're on a mobile device or, you know, do, are we picking up location information, right? So that when I show you movies, I'm gonna show you movies that are nearby and you could actually go see, right? So contextualization. And then we kind of get to this sort of shining top of the hierarchy of needs which is sort of this predictive world that we're all trying to get into with machine learning and you know, lots of analytics and data scientists building creative models, right? And semantic information and natural language processing, right? We're trying to get into this predictive world where our search engines understand what we're trying to do, maybe better than we understand what we're trying to do. So for example, right, um, so uh, I'm very excited to see the movie The Big Sick. I like romantic comedies and I haven't seen a good one in a long time. I also like stand-up comedians and this guy Kumail is apparently a stand-up comedian. Um, so there's sort of this idea that if I go to a movie website, search for a movie and none of them are a good match, but if it knows that I've seen this comedian and I liked him and oh my gosh, now he's in a movie, maybe I ought to say, well, I couldn't find any Arnold Schwarzenegger action flicks for you at the movie theater, but here is another good option because you like this guy, you ought to go see this movie, right? So we're getting into that predictive world where the engine may provide back better answers than we thought, than what we were even asking ourselves, right? So that's sort of the hierarchy of needs for what the searcher is looking for, right? Searchers are trying to get from that very bottom to the very top, and so you are trying to help that search experience go up that cliff. So just to give a quick example, I sort of feel bad about this because it is the World Bank and, you know, but, you know, looking at this website, you know, I typed in solar power, I got results back very fast, I will say, but I also got back 77 billion, 
I'm not sure I couldn't even count the zeros, right? Yeah, that's a pretty basic search engine, right? It's down there at the bottom, and if you've tried to use that website, you will become angry very quickly, or you will be totally apathetic and go do something else, right? I do like in the bottom right corner, they do have a help us make our search better. They're starting to ask for some feedback. But uh, yeah, it is way down there in the hierarchy of needs. So they, you know, users do not like it. I hadn't been on Microsoft Bing in a while, and it had changed. But uh, you know, I went on it, and I typed in solar power. But I actually typoed and put in solar, S-O-L-R, was smart enough to know that really S-O-L-A-R is what I meant, and it gave me some great contextualization. For example, it knows that it's the year 2017, so it's surfacing up a big conference. It you know, also says, well, what do people look for? A lot of people are looking for solar power for their homes, right? These are all good guided suggestions. Plus, it's got some good, fa you know, a good factoid bit of information on there. Now, if I had a real relationship with Bing, in other words, if I was logged in and had done a lot of searching on Bing, I would have expected SOLR power to be returning this conference and topics related to solar, the open source search engine, right? But I'll give Bing a, you know, I, I don't have that relationship with it. So that's, so that's a good example of a website that's sort of really moving up that hierarchy, right? But also one that I wouldn't say is at that really you know, top level actualized predictive engine, right? Which we can understand too, because trying to make a predictive engine when you're indexing the entire internet and answering the entire internet's worth of, uh, internet's worth of questions is also a pretty big problem. So, so um, and then I thought this was sort of timely, right? Anyone recognize this slide? Yeah, so uh, uh, thank you, uh, Peter Dixon Moses, I think, for uh, sending me a screenshot of this slide. But you know, this is sort of another sort of maturity model, only this one's a little bit more about from the perspective of the search industry, and it talks about first we worried about ops, and then apps, and then relevancy, and then intelligence, right? And I would actually argue that it's not such a sequential process of first we worry about one and then the next and then the next and then the next, but that we need to move all four of those marbles some amount and how much we need to invest in each of those areas depends on what problems that we're trying to solve, right? So, but yeah, I thought that this was a, a timely slide. As a quick aside, Maslow, made this, was the first person to say, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Uh, common comment in software, ask me about the queuing engine or the key value store I built using solar one time. So, so where do I figure out how, where I am in that, where my users are in that model and how do I move up to it, right? And how do I move up in the improvement? Well, that's what a maturity model is all about, right? And I'm not talking CMMI level five or any of that, right? I'm talking about something very simple, right? So this is what Martin Fowler said and described. Does that seem pretty obvious? If I want to get to level four and I'm currently at level two, I go to level three first, right? And it's a really obvious, right? Crawl, walk, run, then learn to bicycle, except we do tend to get seduced at conferences like this with like stage four, stage five, learning to rank, and you know these other really great things, and we sometimes forget that to do those things successfully, we have to do some other work first. We have to go up that hierarchy. So real quick, um, you know, I'm just kind of repeating sort of the five levels of um, you know, pretty common maturity model. Basic is you're on the boards. Maybe you're doing a SQL light command, right? Beginner, this is where people are maybe got solar, just starting to use it, right? Know they care about search, but aren't sure what to do. Intermediate, for people at the intermediate level, they're able to run their search effectively, don't have too many errors, and they also don't have to spend a ton of money on it, right? 
For organizations where search is a cost center, right, it's not what makes you special, but it's something you need to enable other things, this is probably where teams end up. I suspect that most of the people at this conference, because you're at this conference, are really in that advanced or should be at that advanced level of sophistication, right? Level four, right? This is where your team is doing more sophisticated things with search compared to the, you know, sort of the industry norm. And where search is what makes your organization special, right? It drives profit, it makes connections, it, it is a strategic asset, right? That's a sort of advanced team. So, and then eventually we get to extreme, right? And I love that quote at the bottom. I think that this very accurately describes Bloomberg, right? If you think Bloomberg you know, really got into solar in a big way three, four years ago and contributed to the core of solar, right? Funding people and time and events and being a big contributor to this conference, right? For any other organization, that would have seemed ridiculous. But for what Bloomberg is trying to do with search in their business, it seems critical that they really own and are integrated with the search platform. So want to show a pretty picture of the continuous integration testing conference where I actually got to meet Martin Fowler in 2007. And in 2009, that community came out with the CI maturity model. And I'll provide a link to it so you guys can see. It's a very easy way of looking at continuous integration, continuous development, and figuring out where am I on that hierarchy and where do I want to be, and therefore, what techniques do I need to embrace and or learn, right? So that looks pretty. So here's the bad news. I don't have this all figured out which is really good because I only have seven minutes left, right? Uh, so uh, I don't have this all figured out, but I do have a first draft. So I'd love it if anyone who's got a laptop out there wants to go and type in that bit.ly link, right? I've talked to my colleagues at work, I've talked to people over the last couple of years, and I've said, you know, what's important to you, right, about organizing your team and figuring out your investments, right? How do you decide whether you should use a hosted provider or run it yourself? Uh, do you need to go into solar cloud or master slave or is a single node solar perfectly fine for what I'm doing? Should I be spending money on scaling or should I be spending money on relevancy or should I be spending money on a pretty user interface or maybe going and cleaning up all of my source data because I've got garbage in and gar leading to garbage out, right? So uh, I came up with these sort of five categorizations, right? And, um, and uh, there is a Google Doc that if you followed that bit.ly link, a Google spreadsheet should have come up, right? And you will see that tab one is this, this is a screenshot from tab one. And tab two is your name here, please. So, uh, um, you know, so this is my first take on sort of the levels of, of what a team at various levels of sophistication, what their infrastructure would look like, right? So, you know, a beginner, probably a single node solar, intermediate, we're probably doing solar cloud, or we have master slave, or we're very comfortable running two single nodes in parallel in case we lose one, right? We're not too, you know, getting too many phone calls in the middle of the night. If I start moving up to that advanced, right, sort of, you know, outpacing my peers, uh, I probably have like a really robust data processing platform, Spark, or homegrown or whatever, right? Uh, I have the ability to sort of scale my solar cloud environment up and down based on load, probably manually, but I can do it, right? It's not a big project. And then sort of at that extreme level, right, I've got maybe a platform for running machine learning at scale, right? And it's a robust platform, works well, no problems. I can do lots of machine learning effectively and efficiently. 
maybe I've got self-scaling solar cloud, right? It's monitoring the amount of traffic and spinning up more nodes as needed, and then when traffic goes down, it gets rid of nodes, right? So that was my take on infrastructure at these different levels. I am looking forward to seeing what other people say in sort of that progression of infrastructure, right? How important is monitoring, right? Is monitoring at the beginner or the beginner or intermediate is probably is the search engine alive and are the queries fast enough, right? At advanced, it's probably starts looking more like what are the quality of your search results or you know um, how many outliers do we have? In sort of the data categorization, right? Uh, maybe I've got some basic XML. Maybe I can handle a single data type at the uh, beginner. Intermediate, I've got lots of, a couple of different data types, not tens or hundreds, but I've got a couple, right? I've got a document that's different than a video that is different than a tweet, and I'm working well with that, right? And I understand what that's going to do to make my users happy, right? And then moving up sort of the progression, right, you guys can kind of see that. Understanding the user, a little bit of a sort of vague -ish sort of uh, category, but, you know, it is really important for us to look at the user and what's actually happening in our search engine, and we, it, we don't spend enough time looking at queries and doing uh, results. So, you know, as excited as I am about sort of a lot of this machine learning stuff and learning to rank and all these exciting, you know, click, and out, click, click boosting and all of that, I do feel like a lot can be done by just looking at the queries that people are lo doing, looking at the results and saying, do these results make sense? Or having a conversation with my users and saying, why was this not a good result and you know, what can we do to get better at that? So, so understanding the user and really understand you know, is, is, I think, a really important thing. And the better we understand the user, the more a high-functioning search team we are, which then opens the door to all these other interesting sort of in, interesting things to play with in the solar world. Your search experience, right? UIs used to be sort of a big thing that we were all debating. It sort of seems to have settled down a lot, right? But there are definitely things we can do. I am very curious to see what happens with voice chat, right? And, you know, voice chat going to move beyond what is Doug Turnbull's phone number and I get a response, right? And moreover to who should I call for help and, you know, it understands and, you know, gives me a number of phone numbers back, right? Uh, I'm very curious to see where that, where that, where that goes, right? Um, I think that in the advanced, it's voice, voice is going to be great for looking up facts, right? When's my next appointment? Uh, how many to-dos do I have? That kind of sort of simplistic thing. And then, you know, extreme is sort of the, the series and Cortana's and uh, all that with more general oriented search. And I don't think we've actually seen the true one yet. And then lastly, uh, putting out a, sh uh, a comment here for culture, right? Um, as a consultant, I visit a lot of search teams, and I see how search is structured in a lot of different organizations, some better and some worse, right? Um, and I do feel like, you know, sort of at that base level, your search team is very ad hoc. It's one person who got the user story that said, make these documents searchable, and stood up a search engine, right? And he did that and then moved on to the next you know, re requirement. At that beginner level, we're really focused on, uh, you know, we have a, for a project, we have a number of people, right? It's very project focused. We're going to build search. We're going to build an autocomplete. We're going to drive faceting on here. We're going to build a matching, right? but the people come together for that project and then disappear kind of after that. Intermediate, where I see a lot of, is the sort of siloed search team. You have a dedicated search team, one, two, five, couple of people, right? And they're a team, and they're responsible for search. They tend to focus more on the ops side 
because that's what they can control in their silo, right? Is the search engine up? Is it running? Is it responding? Is the data coming in? And less about, well, what could search be doing for my business, right? And how do I make better outcomes using search? I see them often a search team and a data science team, and neither of them ever talks to each other, right? Um, I see data scientists produce these great reports and interesting insights, but they never make it into where the end users interacting typically with a search engine can work with that. Typically, though, the search team is on a sort of iterative cycle, right? And they've got some processes around testing and making sure that you're not playing that whack-a-mole game all the time. And then moving up to advanced, right? Uh, I do feel like search really benefits from a multidisciplinary team, right? Whether that's your search team is also active in your web development team or your application development team or your product team, or whether your search team is able to pull those people in and really interact with them, right? But that your search team is not sort of siloed in a corner. You're responsible for the search box and the autocomplete, and that's it. And that your data scientists are actively working with search, right? Uh, recently had a conversation uh, with someone who was like, yeah, the data scientist works in R, and that's all he ever works in. Right, and that, you know, okay, I see that in R, but we're an application, how do I make that translation, right? So your data scientists are working with your search team or a part of your search team. And at the advanced level, your stakeholders, like marketing or product owners or uh, those outside people, are not your foe, but are your friend and are helping you understand what you're trying to do, right? That requires trust and it requires coming up that curve. And then I'll put you know, extreme, right? And that's where your entire business or what you do is based around search, right? And so many of the businesses out there we see are all about making matches between things, right? I, I help you find the right doctor that you need at the right time when you need it, right? Uh, and that would sort of be the very extreme level. So, next steps. So, I have those two links out there, right? And would love, uh, I will post them on uh, Twitter. Uh, I will tweet those two links and say at Lucene Revolution so you can find them. The first one is the CI maturity model, right? I think it distills down in a real simple way understanding how to build software and how sophisticated. I thought it was really a valuable, a valuable approach, and I wish I'd seen it more in our search world than we do, right? Secondly, right, I have a Google spreadsheet where I put what you saw in, but I would really love to hear from other folks what they think is basic, beginner, intermediate, advanced. Right, so there is a tab there, right click, put your name and email address in, love to have a conversation about it. And then lastly, I'm here, would love to talk more. There's my Twitter handle as well as my email address. Thank you. <laughs>